All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream. Today we are at a different time, 2 p.m. today, because we got a real special guest. But before we get to the special guest, uh, I wanted to welcome everybody. This is a stream that's you know very much for artists, and you know I'm very happy to be co-hosting this stream with my buddy Matt Johnson. Hey guys, I'm glad to be here too. Hopefully, I can get to a lot of your questions today. Right on. You know, a lot of times it's the people that you surround yourself with that uh, help to propel you to those high levels. And I've been very lucky in my life to be friends and be acquaintances with many of today's top artists and many of my artistic heroes. So uh, who do we have on the stream today? Well, we have one of my absolute artistic heroes Mr. Nathan Fowkes on the stream. Thank you so much, Nathan, for hanging out with us. Bobby, you are absolutely too kind, but I am thrilled to be here. Um, I know that it's something that I've noticed is a common thread with a lot of your work and a lot of your interviews is telling people that story needs to be a big part, more than the technique and more than the artistic fundamentals that you need to nail down. Tell us about story as it relates to your work. Well, you know, if uh, if it's true that I'm able to bring story across in my work, I've left myself plenty of bandwidth for it. I'm actually really lucky in this regard because I am not a writer. Uh, some artists are. They write their own stories and then they illustrate them. Those people amaze me. Uh, I love to read. I, I do it voraciously, but I'm not a writer. So what happens is somebody else comes up with a really great story they tell me what the story is, and then my job is to visualize it. And so, you know, everybody within the sound of my voice knows that design means to be able to communicate. And so that has been the goal all along, to have the visual language to be able to create a scene, create a moment, uh, set something up where people look at it. And what has to happen is, within just a fraction of a second, they've got to feel a sense of the mood, the emotion, and the story. If that doesn't happen, I have failed. So that is literally my job. You know, that it is really interesting with uh, high-level professionals doing uh, full-out scenes with environments and everything versus uh, you know more of the beginner artists and everything. There's a lot of really great beginner artists with amazing technical skills, but the high-level professionals make their environments including yours, you know, it's practically like secondary characters in the scenes, you know, where it, they go through, the environment will go through all sorts of different moods, yet it's the same environment, and now the environment is kind of scary or happy or romantic and things like that. Uh, how, do you, how does one learn to do that? Well, let me tell you a little story that I think can frame it, because... I've had exactly the same struggles that everyone else does, and I, I almost hate to admit it, but it's been a hard fight to get to story, which has not come naturally to me. Mm. When I started in art school, uh, this was back in the early 90s, and so uh, entertainment design hadn't come onto the scene in any way like it is today. Now every art, uh, art department at a college has to have some kind of an entertainment design to be relevant. Back then it didn't really exist. And so I was uh, a fanatic about drawing and painting and, and did want to be an illustrator. So I went to the Art Center College of Design, uh, Pasadena, here in Los Angeles. And my first term, I had a portfolio review with one of the instructors. And I was, I, I was, uh, I was pushing, trying to make my drawings as good and accurate. And I, I did color work too, but I was kind of getting to that. So I met with this teacher and he went through my portfolio and he asked me a little bit about my interests and such I I said you know I just I love drawing and, and, uh, and painting it's what I want to do and uh, I, I want to do drawings that are believable and have some level of realism and I made a crack I said you know unlike the art uh, unlike everybody over in the fine art department because at that time if you wanted to actually draw you would go into illustration Nobody was drawing in fine art departments.
So it actually looked down on it. They'd gone, you know, way beyond that and conceptualized everything. Well, I had no interest in that, and so I made this crack. Well, it turned out the teacher that I was talking to was actually one of the fine art instructors. Mm -hmm. And so he said, uh, he said, oh, really? Well, show me some of your drawings that you think, you know, are kind of above the fray, like you're saying. And so I showed him what I thought were some of my strongest drawings. And he said, he said, no, no. He said, I know exactly what you're doing here. You're trying, you're trying to be the big man on campus who can draw better than everybody else. It's so obvious looking through your portfolio. And that'll last you about 10 minutes when you get out into the big bad world. Sure, people take a look and they'll say, wow, it looks just like a photograph or it's so, you know, it's, it's so technical. I, how did you do that? And it'll get you 10 minutes of attention and then it's over. And he said, if you don't do work that stretches in some way uh, reality towards emotion, if you don't do that, you're not going to have a career as an artist. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time anybody told me about this. And I had a real tendency to be very technically oriented. And I had to learn, and it was a kind of a hard-fought process to realize being able to observe something and copy it and do a cool-looking drawing, it wasn't enough. It wasn't nearly enough. So that was the beginning. And so through school and then getting into uh, DreamWorks, um, I had to be taken out to the Mojave Desert here. You know, everyone knows that we have the coast. We have the ocean right next to us here in L.A. What they don't think about, on the other side, we have the Mojave Desert. So I had to get dragged out there and beaten a handful of times until I got it through my head story is really king. Mm. So, you know, like, uh, I'm trying to kind of dissect the thought process a little bit. You know, some people, they tend to uh, kind of have these go-to color combinations, lighting schemes for certain uh, moods and by some people, I mean me. <laughs> I think I, I fall into <laughs> well, that. I don't constantly. believe it, Bobby. I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I try to hide it, you know, but um, you don't. I, I, well, that's my own opinion, though. But uh, yeah, when I look at your stuff, it's like it's constantly changing, constantly evolving, and, and constantly, you know, these new and newer color combinations. You know, how do you stay fresh? I still do my daily studies, and that always brings something new. And when I say daily studies, I still look at, like, uh, animated movies come out that I didn't work on, that they did a, a really amazing job uh, at. I, I take a careful look at those. Um, I'm, I'm still out sketching from life uh, on a frequent basis and then doing little sketches from imagination, trying to incorporate, you know, just keep everything together. And so I'm constantly doing that to, to keep that freshness coming in but yeah the the worst thing i see in portfolios is a, a go-to formula like you say mm-hmm. and so uh uh every subject that gets handed to us as an assignment has its unique needs it has its own particular emotion it's a particular part of the story and if we take all of those different subjects and treat them the same way i mean that's that's just that's a crime that's why a formula is such a bad thing and so in my classes, for instance, I'm always talking about hue, saturation, and value. And, and when I'm totally stuck, my go-to thing is to uh, just think about each one of those things. Like I may have a color combination that's really challenging, so I'll, the, it's just not working. So I'll take everything, and I'll make everything a similar value, so the values unify all these crazy colors. And so I have some kind of a thing to hold it all together. If, uh, if that's not a good solution, then I'll think about temperature. And maybe I'll push everything towards a temperature. If it gets too boring, I'll pop something back out of it. If, uh, if it's too saturated, I'll desaturate. I'll pick, a, I'll pick a range to desaturate and let the other parts stay more saturated. Or if the hues are getting a little bit out of control, then I'll push everything towards a specific hue and then let some important parts come back out. So I'm always looking, you know, color is complex. It's very easy for it to get busy and get away from us. So I'm always looking for that unifying element. So 
so that each color in the combination has some kind of a meaningful relationship to the rest. Mm. I like that. So do you think that it's, um, how does that balance that problem solving that needs to be done as, as, as amazingly talented as you are at solving those problems, how do you still bring the emotional inspiration, the warm and fuzzies right there along with it, you know, <clears throat> because I can see a lot of people get really bogged down in the technical details. I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of back end stuff. I definitely, well, well, two things. I usually do a quick, simple little, we call them color keys, usually just a, a little sketch that establishes the look and the tone. And so I'll usually do a little color key sketch. And I paint it very small these days, of course. It's primarily digital, though I like to keep the paint splashing around as well for, for myself. But uh, so I'll put it at a very low resolution uh, so I can't get caught up in detail and find a direction. And so that helps me keep, keep the idea very, very direct mm -hmm. and simple. But then the actual assignment, uh, you guys know how these things go. You have an assignment where, okay, we're going to do this environment, and it has to have all these different things in it, and it has to have these characters, oh, and this other thing, and then can you put a helicopter crashing in the background? <laughs> and you know, and it gets it gets completely nuts. And so I try as hard as I can. I actually keep this color key. I blow it up, and I keep it over top. I keep it in a separate layer up above everything. And I'll click it back on and see how I'm drifting away from it, getting caught up maybe in individual details and getting distractions in there. And I'll push the simplicity back into it. And then when I get to the finish, undoubtedly there's going to be some busyness, some distractions. And so I'll go back in and uh, I'll push and pull and make sure that the contrast is where it needs to be. I'll have decided what is this image primarily about. Let's make sure the contrast is there. Again, con uh, it could be a lot of different things, but contrast of hue, contrast of saturation, contrast of value, contrast of edge, contrast of shape. I know everyone out there is taking notes right now, so I can write <laughs> down those, those five things. So I make sure that those things exist where they need to be, and anywhere else where there's contrast that might pull the eye away too strongly, I find a way to knock that back down. And I'll throw one more thing in. Uh, sometimes I'll do a color sketch that I really feel good about, and then I have to take it to a finish. And you know how in your quick sketch you have some fresh brush strokes and some little, uh, little things because it was spontaneous. There might be a good spontaneous feel that is just nearly impossible to get into the finished piece. I'll actually layer mask. Uh, like I may have kind of a fresh brush stroke in the sketch, I'll just go back into my finish, and in little areas here and there, I'll layer mask little softly, little bits of my sketch into it. And so there'll be that one fresh brush stroke that I'll sneak in. There'll be that little bit of texture that just happened, a happy accident. And I'll actually layer mask back in little bits of my sketch so it maintains that feeling of spontaneity. That's one of my little little tricks to keep that that kind of brush alive in the artwork now when you were talking about uh you do your daily sketches and that's how you stay fresh with your color palettes and expand your color palettes and and all sorts of lighting situations and all that kind of stuff i know this you know you've been doing it for years and years and years and you're you know, looking at your classes, when if anybody in the chat has ever taken any of your classes, definitely uh, let us know how it went for you because um, it's a great way for everybody to kind of know the importance and the experience that people will have taking your class. Uh, you also concentrate on the fundamentals, very simple sounding things, just like everything that you were saying just now is very easily digestible everybody understands it but to master it, it becomes very hard um yep. you've been doing this you know daily sketches for so long i think of myself as disciplined until you kind of come into a conversation i'm like oh nathan yeah i'm not as disciplined as nathan you know nathan has been doing studies and concentrating on fundamentals and all this stuff for so long 
uh, generally, fundamentals kind of seem a little less interesting than those quick tricks and one minute tutorials press this button press that function and you're gonna you know dodge and burn and you're gonna have something cool how do you stay so disciplined well because bobby it is my one shot i've got one shot at this i'm an average guy you know and I, I'm, I'm fine with that um i think average human intelligence anyone can do yeah, just you know you can do amazing things with that people people are pretty smart you know you learn processing power and, and just what can be done it's it's extraordinary well you know I'm, I'm I'm pretty pretty average in in so many ways and so this is my one thing it's my I, I don't know I, I guess it's my one shot at glory and so I it's just um, uh, I cannot stand the idea of just being some kind of face in the crowd uh, I've I've always uh, just had a, a deep desire to be someone who can bring something to the table because uh, what what counts in regard to what you're talking about you know uh, if if we it, it's kind of the most human thing when you can do something that is meaningful to other people you're significant if it's just you know you have this ability to make your friends really happy you know you're a good dad you're a doctor and you can heal people. I mean, that is the name of the game right there. That you can do something that's of value to other people. If you can't, you're not significant. And it's just unthinkable. And so this is my shot, you know, to, to entertain people, to bring uh, some interesting pictures and visuals into the world. Um, I've, I've been so pleased to be able to sell some of my watercolor paintings. They're, they're hanging up in people's houses yeah, I got in their living too. room <laughs> uh, you do i i'm thrilled i can't tell you if anyone uh, some of your a while back some of your we met, uh, actually right it, it was it was part of our our introduction if anyone sees some some of your videos if they see a duck swimming in the background with a reflection underneath it um i am just tickled pink every single time <laughs> I, I see one of your videos where i can see my painting in the background so that's that just makes my day to have been able to do that. And so that's where that's where the desire comes from. But, you know, I, I totally understand that. And that's something that a lot of people, they can relate to, especially in the beginning, because they don't want to be lost in a crowd and all that stuff. But uh, something that I love is watching UFC, you know, people <laughs> cage fighting. Uh, and what happens is, is that once you become the champ, it's almost inevitable that people start to train less. They start to slack and things like this, but you haven't, you know. Um, do you schedule in time to do these practices or are they spontaneous? Really tr just trying to get to the little tiny details that can probably make a difference for people out there. Well, good question. And, and you are, uh, like, talking about talking about the uh, yeah the, the fighters who hit a peak that's actually professionally uh, one one of my worst fears is uh, getting soft you know getting older and getting soft and losing that hungry edge uh, I, I don't think I've I don't think I've lost it yet for the reasons I was just talking about but you know you work so hard and maybe you find a modest success and you're able to provide a comfortable living for your family and you want to enjoy that. And at this stage, you know, I'm in kind of my mid-ish 40s. I've got three kids, and uh, and it's it's tough. Uh, it's tough finding that line where you know, let's go play with the kids all day. Let's let's take some time off, and I'll take a vacation, and uh, let's let's kind of enjoy the fruits of the labors and and let it slip away a little bit. Well, a part of me really wants to do that, and a part of me is horrified by it. So what I've kind of come to, and this is not necessarily a good thing, because a person needs a well-rounded life, but the two things I care about in life, you know, I, I'm, I'm the most happily married guy you ever met. Um, I, uh, I didn't meet my wife until my, my mid-30s, and thank goodness I waited. I have three kids. I, I care about them more than life itself, and I care about, about being an artist. 
And so if you're going to do, for me and my limitations, if I'm going to do those two things well, there's nothing left. There's no hanging out with the guys a couple of nights a week. There's no, uh, there's no watching, uh, 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 you know, there's no following a sports team and, and watching three-hour-long games. Uh, as much as I would like to do all of those things, it's just not a possibility within what's more important to me. So people, people say, and I, I think it's true, uh, about sacrifice. Uh, a sacrifice is giving up something good to gain something even better because all these other things that we can and maybe even should do, they're good things, but you have to let some of them and maybe many of them go so that you have the time to be able to put the extra effort because what you mentioned about watching the YouTube tutorials and, you know, download the brush pack, push this button and throw that filter on and, hey, it looks pretty cool. There's a sea of about 100,000 people who are really good at that and there's not the opportunities for them because they're all about at the same level. Their work looks kind of good. And if we don't stick ahead above that crowd, there's no opportunity for us to, uh, to, to really do something special. But Bobby, I think your question was really about maybe kind of the, the nitty gritty, like day to day schedule of making these things happen. Yes. Mm hmm. Well, so I can, like, the first the first thing I do, uh, when I get out of bed, I immediately go to my desk and I start working. That's the first thing, uh, first thing that I do. So I'll work for, uh, I'll work for an hour or two. Let me, actually, I should take a step back. At night, I figure out what do I need to do the next day and what, uh, and I also figure out what sketch do I want to do? What do I want to practice? Oh. And I have that out and ready because if I, sit down and I start like, well, what am I going to sketch? Let me look through my reference files. Let me look at some photos I took of an interesting place the other day and I mill around and mill around. The moment's gone. And so I have it ready so that when I get up, I sit down and I get the ball rolling and it sets the tone for the rest of the day. And it's not until after that I actually go take a shower and get something to eat, you know, and then I, and then, and do what needs to be done. There are business emails that have to be sent and such. And then I come back to work and I've kind of set the stage and kind of ramped up so I'm more in the zone than I would have otherwise been. That's a very good answer. Um, you know, and something that inspires me about you and Bobby, Nathan, is as much as it is a burning desire to be significant and to make a mark uh, with what you create, you're both so humble about what you do. And I think there's a little bit to say there about the idea that you will work hard to stay ahead because you know there are other artists that are amazing right next to you doing this work. Can you speak to that humility just a little bit? And then I promise, guys, I'm going to get to some viewer questions momentarily. Yeah, well, I'll tell you right now. So uh, Bobby Chu is one of my favorite artists. And so I'll tell you what my response to that is. Bobby, I'm going to burn you down. I'm coming for you. Uh, <laughs> you. You may be you may be out in front of me, but I am coming fast. And I'm not just going to, you know, I, I'm not just going to outdo you. I am going to I'm going to blow right by you. So <laughs> keep keep that competitive <laughs> keep that competitive edge. But we all know we see what everybody else is, uh, can do. You know, and especially with the uh, the internet and the easy access it's not just looking at a handful of old masters or the top illustrators from the 1970s anymore. We see everybody's best work. And it's kind of horrifying what people can pull off. And, uh, and it makes you realize if, if you're standing still, well, these other people are, are not. And so that's just that's a, that's a very present thing. It's very easy for us to be aware of our limitations. And uh, you can you can let that make you want to quit, or you can let that force you to uh, take it as far as you're personally able to go. I think the feeling is mutual for me, <laughs> you know, trying to work with, uh, you know, my artistic heroes like Nathan uh, keeps you on your toes for sure. Um, but the other thing that works super well and it's only been in the last like two years that I've been doing this is I will 
always have a subscription class going on where you know it's well for me it's nothing because you know I, I run schoolism but uh, for <laughs> anybody else out there it's fifteen dollars a month and then you just always have this class you know and you're always just taking your time and whenever you have time you put on a video or whenever you're drawing you put on a video and even if you're drawing something else even if you're drawing a bunch of you know like a ZBrush thing like I'm doing on the screen right now you start seeing all this uh, this amazing you know imagery and lessons about environments or compositions perhaps if you're taking one of Nathan's courses and then it inspires you you know and it adds to whatever you're doing even if that wasn't what you were looking for that's something that I constantly do to constantly inspire myself and when you do that the best thing of all is if you're not just watching but you're watching you're extrapolating the info you're trying to apply it to your own stuff you'll start to see that your work will just constantly evolve constantly grow and that makes me feel good you know and and that makes me addicted to learning which is really one of the best kind of habits to have because it doesn't matter if you weren't born the best artist in the world. Um, you know, Nathan says he's just the average guy. Of course, 99.9% .9 of us don't believe that. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm the average guy too. And it's just because I have this thing where I'm just like, okay, I'm the average guy. Yeah, totally. Maybe even below average in, uh, in a lot of aspects or respects but i'm constantly learning so before you know it you're not the average guy anymore and it seems to and me that sorry go ahead, go ahead Nathan, sorry. well i was just gonna gonna add to that um having that uh having that constant thing because uh, I, I i love doing the same thing sometimes you have something like uh, ted talks when they're talking about amazing new technology and these people are coming up with stuff like you know, wow, people are figuring this kind of stuff out. Surely I can figure out how to put four colors together in an interesting way. And so in the background, it, it gives you this sense of, of rising to a higher level. Like I'm uh, speaking of being average. I'm no athlete, but I do play some tennis. And whenever I play against someone who's a little better than me, you know, not someone who can just smoke me and, and put me to shame, but I'm playing against someone who's better, I actually play better than someone who's at a similar level like it, it automatically you somehow rise up with that and so yeah bobby with what you're talking about with that learning in the background i i think we inherently just people in general do a little better when we surround ourselves with uh, material like that yeah and the other thing is is like a lot of times the hardest thing is just having that idea of what i'm gonna paint or what am i gonna learn you know, this takes that away because you're always, you know, I'm, I'm always learning from somebody. There's always one class that's just always playing, right? And that just feeds the inspiration. That just feeds the ideas and that just feeds the n next thing to learn. Just like, uh, you know, for those of you that are watching this live, you know, I'm doing this uh, ZBrush painting, uh, ZBrush slash Photoshop painting. And so I'm combining all sorts of things, all sorts of different uh, lessons and classes that I've taken into one, you know, and, and last year, you never would have even seen me do any kind of ZBrush stuff. It's just this constant learning. Yeah. And, uh, and Matt, I'm sorry, I cut into what you were starting to say. You're totally fine. Nathan, you can interrupt me all day long, sir. Oh, um, I will like <laughs> Well, I do want to get to a couple of questions. People are asking some great ones here. Um, one that kind of follows from this, uh, you guys, when you're not always able to compete with somebody right next to you, somebody who's nearby, who's a little better than you, you're left to self-critique. So can you maybe give us a little insight as to what you're thinking, Nathan, when when you're seeing the weak spots in your own artwork and the strengths in your own artwork, how do you self-critique? I actually have a little trick for that, and maybe maybe this might help other people. Here, here's one one thing that happens to me all the time, like one mistake I make, 
because you know I'm I'm sitting in a dark room. My concept art primarily in Photoshop is as for many of us, and so I'm sitting in a dark room staring at the screen. And even if I'm doing maybe kind of a low key painting, your eyes adjust to it and it starts to feel brighter and brighter. And the colors, you know, you start it for a long time and and they they're a little richer. You kind of get attuned to it. And so I catch myself frequently. Uh, I feel like the image is bright enough, it's saturated enough, and then someone else looks at it, maybe someone walks in from outside, out from the sunshine, you know, and their eyes haven't adjusted to a monitor, like, for instance, a director at one of the studios, you know, and they, they come in from the hall and look at it, and it looks dim and dull to them, and it is. And so I have this folder of favorite artwork by other artists, and it has a range. I picked all these images some are very low key, some are very high key, some are very saturated, some are very desaturated, but all of them, in my opinion, done beautifully. Other artists, artists that I admire. And so it's a folder of maybe 20, 30 images. I take uh, any major image I do, I always do this. I finish the image, I put it in that folder somewhere in the middle, just throw it in there. And then I click through these pictures and finally come to mine, and boom, oh my gosh. I thought I had enough contrast. My image is weak, you know, because I've just compared it to real images that really work. Or, oh my gosh, uh, my, my saturation is dull. It doesn't have the richness that it should have. And so by comparing to these this wide range of other images, I'm able to, it's almost as if, you know, I have those 20 people in the room critiquing my piece, just like that. And I'm I have such a problem after staring at my image for, you know, five, ten hours, that this is my solution for that. Bobby, do you have any uh, input on that as well? Because, I mean, I think that's great to have that nearby because you're almost like simulating having those other artists nearby. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, I, I have a folder like that. I haven't updated it in quite a bit, so I, you know, whenever I dip into it, I'm just like, uh boring 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 to me you know like <laughs> not that that they look boring but just like the act of uh taking something from that is less interesting at that point you know it's natural um so what i've been doing is uh lately art station you know i go to art station i refresh the the home page i sift through just like a ton of thumbnails and then i just click on one and you know, go into that, um, that works pretty good for me. And then if I really just have no ideas, you know, like I said, I go back to learning because, um, if I don't have a good idea to paint, I don't want to paint it. Right. But if you're taking a lesson, you're learning something, you have an objective. And a lot of times when you have some limitations to what it is you're supposed to do, you're going to do a way better job and have a way easier time starting that painting don't you think Nathan absolutely yeah having having limitations is a actually critical because having limitations means you have to think about it a little bit more and be a little bit direct you have to say what is this image really about and is this what's the simplest idea about this image because I have all these limitations and so I need to get down and dirty that's absolutely good advice that's really great. Do you uh, feel, Nathan, that um, those limitations when it comes to a professional environment like working at a studio are different than the classroom? Well, let's see. There, there's, there's so many different limitations. Uh, you know, the, the, the time, the, the particular story moment, I, and I mean the, the time that you have available to do, to do the image, for instance. But what I can, what I, probably the best way for me to answer that, right now I'm teaching uh, school is environment design. And in many, if not most cases, the best environments, they're about something. They have a concept or a story moment or an emotion, something they need to get to. So uh, I just literally, uh, last night I critiqued the students' studies where I give an exercise they pick environments that they like, uh, uh, reference uh, from animation games, art station, anything. They pick 12 of them, 
and then they do copies of those. But here's the extraordinary limitation. They're allowed to copy it in three values only. Any three values doesn't have to be white, middle, black, and no soft edges. It has to be razor sharp, hard edges. And so all they have is three values and shape design and no other considerations. And that is such a difficult challenge that you have to stop and really analyze the original. Why does it work? What is it about? And the best students totally cheat in the sense that there's a dark figure silhouetting against something light in the original, and they say, there's no way I can make that work in three values. It's impossible. And they'll reverse that and have it be a dark figure against light or light figure against dark. And so they actually have to think about what will make their sketch read under extraordinary limitations. And the thought process gives them a, a rock-solid foundation in simple value design and simple shape design, which is at the core of just about any good image. And so that's my best example of an extreme limitation actually giving you a, a great foundation for doing really great work. Yeah, it's super it's, difficult, too. It's like it's easy to do, but it's super hard to do well. Yep. Yep. Um, here's a great viewer question here. Um, do you guys, uh, Nathan, uh, do you have a preference for digital or traditional mediums? You are so proficient in both that it's hard to even ask you that question. Do you have a preference? No. Uh, the reason... Uh, I definitely, digital is, is better for a production environment for, for obvious reasons, to make changes and within the pipeline and everything. But as far as personal preference, I enjoy the one because I have to do the other, so to speak. So it, it actually leads to some problems because sometimes uh, maybe someone uh, uh, is nice and offers to, uh, I don't know, maybe show some of my artwork on their website. And occasionally they'll say, well, send us some of your concept art, but not for the studios because we're concerned about copyright. We don't want to, you know, get into that. So send us some of your personal concept art. And unfortunately, I don't have any, uh, not much anyway. There's some. But uh, when I'm done with my real work, you know, my, my uh, work for hire, I want to reach for the charcoal. I want to reach for the watercolors and splash that around. I enjoy it as kind of a relief from the digital painting. But then, you know, um, dealing with that paint, it turns, into, it turns into a big mess. There's a level of frustration with physical paint as much as I enjoy it. And then it kind of feels good to go back to Photoshop and I can just hit the undo button or paint over something. I don't have to go to the sink and, and wash all these pigments or end up at the grocery store with phthalo green smeared across my face, not realizing it's there and, you know, getting funny looks and not knowing why. So to do the one makes the other one more fun. Hmm. Bobby, what about you with that? Uh, well, Bobby, you do your show in France every year, and you use traditional media. Am, am, am I right for that? I, I do. Uh, well, every few years, we'll, Ken and I will spend you know, like a month or 40 days in Paris and uh, just paint away, you know, with this looming deadline of a gallery show that they're already advertising and all that stuff. It's awesome. It's pressure, but you're in Paris and it's just great. Uh, yeah, I use acrylic. I use acrylic paint. Um, learned most of my techniques from Thomas Fleury's uh, oil painting class, actually. Uh, the technique is very easily transferable. Um, watercolor. And Thomas is amazing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, stunning, stunning uh, work that he does. Um, I forget what the original question was. Actually. Oh, the original question was: Is there sort of a preference between digital and traditional for you? Um, because oh, you guys are right. both proficient at both of those things. I go through stages. I can't stick around one thing for too long. I know that about myself now. And it's it's actually really great because you, like, for example, the ZBrush thing. I get into the ZBrush thing. I'm just doing ZBrush. Uh, when I go back to just painting normally, I 
remember things from the ZBrush experience and I can better kind of evol evolve my game, you know, kind of like how to use that UFC kind of analogy again, uh, it's mixed martial arts, you know, so you start learning boxing and then you bring it back into your craft and then you learn uh, capoeira and then you bring that back into your craft and Thai boxing and so on and so forth. You know, it. I find that's one of the best kind of fast forwards in your uh, evolution as an artist. That's really good. And I've, I've actually found that uh, digital painting has made me a much better traditional artist because there is, you know, there's obvious benefits from traditional medium. You have a painting you can put up on the wall, you can put it in the gallery, and that physical craft, you know, we, um, um, that that's, that's, what we all came from, use our hands and make something back to that human thing of making something useful. But in digital media, uh, you know, everything we see is back to those three elements that I mentioned earlier, hue, saturation, and value. That is everything visual. And with digital media, you can independently manipulate those three things. You know, you have a nice brush stroke. You don't have to lose it. You can change the hue, saturation, or value digitally. And so, uh, the the best approach uh, digitally is thinking about hue, saturation, and value and the ways that you can manipulate that. And so the digital media forces you into that realm. And then when you come back to painting, you're not so caught up in let me mix the paint right and put the stroke down right. You're thinking about what's the right hue, what's the right saturation, what's the right value. And... Uh, I'm, I'm a better digital painter because of my traditional work, but vice versa is true as well. Yeah, and about those uh, little the topics that Nathan was saying, uh, much of the thoughts that go through my head when I start talking, you know, start dealing with or thinking about hue, uh, value, saturation, is Nathan's class actually. If I don't, if you don't mind me giving a little shout out to your designing with uh, color and light. For those of you that are interested, get on that, and you, you'll open your eyes to a whole new way of thinking. It's a really good class, it. Nathan. It really is. I, I started taking that class, and it just ten minutes in, I'm already amazed at that class. Yeah, the it's main really... thing I think about when I took that class was, why didn't they teach me this in school? You know, I wasted <laughs> all this time learning all this other stuff. Yep. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 there were very good aspects of my education, and back in the 90s, there was some serious lacks as well. And I'll go ahead and say, because Bobby, you know, I've, I've talked about this, and there's no, um, it's a long time out, there's no release date, but this is so important that I'm starting to formulate an additional schoolism class about color scripting, specifically, you know, specifically about storytelling. And uh, it's not just color and light. You know, we talk, we'll talk about things like shape language, line language, and the other elements that make up. Because a color script isn't just a color script. It's shape design. It's uh, timeline. Lots of different things that make it up. But I'm just starting to kind of uh, formulate that, that class. And that'll be an opportunity for people who uh, have taken the color and light class and the other schoolism classes and got that foundation to really dig into the storytelling aspects of it. Like I say, um, these classes take hundreds of hours to put together, so don't look for it, you know, uh, don't look for it in 2017, but maybe in 2018 we'll, we'll have it up and out there for all you guys out there to, to really do this thing, you know, to, to be able to bring a story to your audience where they, they look at it, they don't have to have gone to art school, they don't have to have some kind of a high concept, they just look at your work and they just feel it because uh, no matter what we lack, uh, part of the discussion was about Bobby and I maybe having some humility, uh, which, which I, I think we do. With everything that we lack and all of you guys out there listening, all the things you feel like you're not good at, the moment that you develop the ability to connect emotionally with your audience, that's the moment that you become a real artist, even if you aren't good at everything. That's great because that leads to something that I really wanted to touch on today, which is your 
You mentioned uh, in an interview I saw that when you do a landscape, Nathan, oftentimes it's the portrait of that landscape. It's as though you're painting a person's portrait. You're trying to embody something that connects with people. And nothing is more true of that than when you're doing one of your charcoal portraits. Um, it, can you speak to that for a second about how to find something interesting when you're looking at, at a portrait? What is it that really sets that spark off for you? Yeah, great, great question. I, I appreciate that because uh, I actually just recently, I, I, I couldn't resist. So I have my, uh, my drawing book is out from Design Studio Press, How to Draw Portraits and Charcoal. It's a book that I put two, uh, spent two years putting together, and we're really proud of it. And it's uh, it's very well reviewed, which I'm so happy about, and and doing doing very well. It's we feel like we have a successful book out there. At the same time, I couldn't resist reading the uh, the Amazon reviews recently, and uh, I'm, they're they're very positive. Well, you know, no book can be all things to everyone, of course. So there's going to be a few people out there that the book didn't work for, which is fine. But I read one of the reviews, and I actually felt really I, – I almost wanted to, to talk to the guy because he sounded very enthusiastic about learning portraits. But he, he wrote in the comments – I think he said he even sent the book back. He said, I expected a book that really, you know – spent the length of it showing me the techniques and the materials and how to put the charcoal down and really be be about the techniques. And he said, you know, the, the book does talk somewhat about techniques, but it also spends a good amount of time talking about, uh, about, about principles and theory. And so, you know, I, I sent the book back. And I remember thinking, are you kidding? My friend, I, it's over for you. I mean, no amount of technique will save you when you're looking at a person. You're you're sitting across from a person. You see them in full 3D stereoscopic vision, and you're going to translate that three-dimensional thing that you perceive. You're going to translate it onto a two-dimensional surface. That is hard. It's extraordinarily hard. It's so hard that many people fail before they train themselves how to translate the 3D world to the two-dimensional world. And it gets even worse than that. Uh, you look at someone maybe under bright lights, you're trying to copy a range of light to dark that you can see with your eyes. You're trying to copy it with a stick of charcoal and a white piece of paper, meaning you're trying to recreate something you see in a medium that is not capable of reproducing it. That takes theory and it takes principles to be able to translate uh, what you're seeing and get it to read clearly and beautifully on a two-dimensional page. So technique is critically important. You have to be able to put the charcoal down in a meaningful way, but you have to. It has to be driven by solid principles of getting a, a nuanced sense of character and pushing and pulling in a sense that you feel the sense of 3D, even if you have to cheat a little bit to get that three-dimensional wraparound quality into your portrait. And usually you do have to cheat. Almost always you have to cheat a little bit to get it to read clearly. And so uh, that's exactly what the, the book has been all about. Uh, I shouldn't say all about because it does. I, I show step-by-step. Step, I show technique and try and cover that as reasonably as possible. But um, that's the name of the game. How do you recreate the nuance of a person with the medium that, in fact, is not capable of doing it? Got to have some good ideas. And so that's what the, re the resource that I have out there for everyone to achieve that. I know I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of that book. I just can't wait for it to show up. No, it's good. All right. I, I have one myself. And, and I think the one thing that I really liked about it was not just uh, the ability to kind of get the idea, a good idea from looking at somebody's uh, portrait or looking at somebody's face and, you know, creating a portrait out of it. But it's, what I loved about it was uh, how you decide on what to tackle, you know, because it's just endless information and you kind of um, curate the information and put it on your page for anybody interested. Well, and that's what's so great about um, the classes, I think, is taking a lot of the noise out because for someone like me who's a student like everybody else in the audience, 
Um, I'm, I see so many opportunities to learn, um, but I don't see it often distilled and filtered the way you guys manage to do it in your classes. Would you like to speak to that, Nathan? Yeah, because um, I love the word distilled because everything we do is so complex. And so one of the things that I've, I've come to is that uh, it's not always so much about what you put in your work. It's at least equally about what you leave out of your work. And that should be a primary consideration. I don't think that's intuitive. You know, we think about, you know, I, I, I got to make it look good. I've got to make it look real. I, I, what texture should I put? Can I put in? Um, what colors can I put in? And so we have that kind of positive mindset. Equally important to that <clears throat> is the consideration of what we leave out. Because most of the work we do, uh, we want it to be about something, a landscape painting, a portrait, a piece of concept artwork. We want it to be about something, an emotion, a sense of character, a mood, or just maybe uh, we were captivated by the light of a landscape and the shadow patterns. And so we don't want to distract away from that simple idea by throwing all kinds of other contrasts at it. And so for our work, uh, for our work to really be about something, and that's poetry. Poetry, you know, poetry is putting things together uh, in a meaningful way and leaving out anything that will distract from it. That's the big answer, is leaving out anything that might muddle, dilute, or distract from your concept. And see, it also seems like um, you always have your you always have your thoughts in the right places, you know, instead of like, okay, I'm staring at this eye, you know, and the eye is in shadow and I'm getting all the little subtleties of that eye instead of kind of taking a step back, looking at the whole entire thing and going, actually all those details in that eye is totally not necessary except for maybe this one little dark mark and this one little tiny light mark. Absolutely. You nailed it, Bobby. Yeah, I have somewhere in the history of my blog or posts or somewhere, I have a close-up on an eye where uh, uh, when you look at it from far away, it's the shape of an eye in light and shadow. When you look at it close, you can't even tell what it, what it is. And I was just trying to make the point once again, uh, uh, rather than caught up in, in the nuances, it's, a, it's about what you leave out. Now, um, I want to also get to a bunch of these uh, these viewer questions here because there's a mm. lot of really good ones um so nathan asks uh nathan jensen asks what would you say is the most important element you have found that is essential to uh, telling a story in a single image i know we kind of touched on different aspects of this but if you had to kind of narrow it down to just you know, I don't know if you can distill it to one thing, but can you? I I, I think I think so. Um, if if we have to get down and dirty, yeah. So uh, a good image. And I, I'm kind of thinking in terms of concept art here, because especially I I do some work in in games, but primarily far away it's been animation, and so these scenes are up on the uh, screen, you know, for a few seconds frequently. And if the audience isn't with you in a quarter of a second, uh, you're in trouble. And they, they can be. The, the visual, our, our visual perception, you can take something in in, a, in less than a second and really understand it. Visual cortex, extraordinary processing power. So we don't have to worry about how smart our audience is. They are. They're smart. It's built into them. So we have to have that immediate read like we're talking about often it's the the sense of emotion and so uh i immediately go my my immediate my two go-to things are what color palette and this is the part we touched on uh what color palette will lend itself to that emotion what range of color hues you know reds greens whatever uh what 
what level of saturation or not, and what range of values. Should it be a very narrow, limited palette of values? Should it be a very contrasty palette of values? So uh, I'm going to go back to that. But the other thing that I immediately look, look for is shape language. And it can be as simple as it's a friendly kind of a moment. Things are rounded. They're not too forceful. Things are kind of soft and rounded. It's a scary, dangerous moment. Boom. We hit the high contrast value, and we hit the high contrast shapes. The color depends on the situation. So uh, the simple shape language and the simple color palette are my two go-to things to immediately make that emotional connection. Awesome. I also want to just answer a quick question about the uh, illustration I'm making here from my buddy Noah from Israel. She was saying, "Is oh hey Noah, yeah, it's good uh, good to hear from you, Noah. She she and I have worked together as well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Noah's awesome. <laughs> so she asks, you know, was there a sketch that I'm working from for this thing and uh, a bunch of people were asking this, so I just want to address this. Uh, there was no sketch, um, but there was a very clear idea that I had in my head of uh, this funny-looking creature that's holding up this tiny little plant creature and kind of looking at it, and the, the sun is shining, it's nice and bright, and that, that was the initial thought in my head, and I just kind of went with that. Um, all the little details, the hair and what kind of hair and all that stuff was more just on the fly. That's really Gosh, that's a good question. I, probably as far as thinking through specific moments, um, I'd probably have to think of there, there are, but I'd probably, you know, in my mind, what I would do is I'd jump back to art school and kind of scroll through scroll through DreamWorks and think about think about what the moments are. I shared one of them about you know the portfolio teacher who told me your work you think you're a good artist but your work is not cutting it you know and that was that was something that I I definitely needed to hear. So along the way I've had moments like that. And usually uh, it, it, it comes from critique, you know, being open to critique. And if I have done, uh, if I have work out there that people like and, and found some kind of a modest success in the quality of the work, a big part of it is every single day at work, you know, you're at DreamWorks, you're at Disney, you're at, at uh, wherever it's been. Someone comes in, looks over your shoulder and tells you, what they think is working in your image and what is not. And so having been around that caliber of artist, I mean, you just don't know. I, I talk about feeling a need to fight, to rise up. You're in the visual development hall at DreamWorks, and next door to you is Paul Lassane. And on the other side of your office is Marcos Mateo Mestre and Scott Wills and Richard da Daskus and Dominic Lewis and I probably shouldn't be naming names because I'll, I'll leave out 20 of them, you know, but they're all, I mean, the level that these people were at. Do you know what it feels like to be in a, a hall of people that are at that level? You're very aware of what they can do well and where you might lack. And so that's been the old kind of the, the long, slow burn kind of a breakthrough is to be able to work with these artists, um, learn from them. And then an art director, you know, especially as a, a junior artist coming up, an art director, a production designer, or a director is coming into your office roughly every other day and showing you what's working and what's not working. So, you know, seek out critique, seek out advice. Uh, a second pair of eyes, I, I almost can't do it with a second pair of eyes because we all have our blind spots. We just do. And that second pair of eyes is immediately going to see what we didn't see. I just want to make sure those second pair of eyes have good eyesight, though. You know, you're talking that, about there's, there's the best of the best. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> because I've heard, you know, also some students, they'll come to me and they'll tell me, that, you know, the advice that perhaps their teacher gave them. And it, it's really the most horrible, the most... Um, <laughs> You know, just poisonous advice. For example, this person, you know, was asking me, um, 
what else do you think I could do with my art? You know, I look at their portfolio and I'm like, it looks like you want to be a character designer. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I did. Um, but my teacher says it's a bad idea. There's too many character designers out there. You won't be able to get a job. Everybody's going to have more experience than you and all this stuff. And I was just like, wow, is that, it really felt like that advice was the thoughts that was going through that teacher's mind, perhaps, that wanted to be a character designer in the past or something, you know, but that was completely venom, you know, like uh, poisonous for this, this up and coming artist, you know, ev everybody, there's, there's always room, there's always room, it's not going to be easy. And that's how we yep. kind of filter out. That's how the industry will filter out, you know, people. And then those people will say, oh, becoming a character designer, it's impossible. It's way too hard. It's not true. Yeah, I, my very first day at Art Center, at art school uh, here in L.A., uh, we, we had the orientation. And so one of the teachers, one of the illustration teachers, took us around and talked to us about the program and had our first day orientation. And so we're all sitting in a group at the end, you know, the, the, the instructor, you know, do you guys have any questions? And one of the people in the group said, you know, this school pumps out hundreds of people. Uh, every year pumps out hundreds of people to go out into the field. And there's art schools all around the country, all around the world that do the same thing. I mean, and this is illustration program, so there's kind of a commercial art orientation. And uh, he said, you know, uh, there there's not that much work. There's not that many jobs. So, I mean... Is what we're doing here a good idea? Well, being where we were, of course, he's obligated to say, oh, yeah, of course, it's a great idea. But he said the right thing. He said, there's always room for good work. So if you're a really great artist who can stand, find a way uh, doing what you care about, because if you do what you care about, I'm kind of stating the obvious, but <clears throat> excuse me. If you uh, if you're doing what you care about, you're going to do it harder and longer and practice more. You're going to stand above the crowd, and then opportunities will find their way to you. So I don't think people I don't think people need to worry about that. But the the one thing that I do not have an answer for is you're being given advice and you're not sure if it's good advice or not. And I don't have a good answer for distinguishing that because there might even be a really great artist you're talking to that just has a different direction than you do. And uh, in the end, I, I guess the only thing I could say is if it pulls you away from what you really care most about doing uh, to to a level that won't even let you do that thing, probably it's not appropriate advice for you. Yeah, and another way to kind of say that, I feel, is – Advice that's driven by fear, don't listen to it. Listen to the that, advice where it's like it's driven by logic. And when you think about it logically and makes sense, that's good advice. Well said. It's very well said. And that is pretty much the, um, you know, time goes by super quick. I do want to let people know that might not know is that Nathan teaches four different classes on schoolism composition you know pictorial composition environment design designing with light and color and landscape sketching with gouache which is phenomenal all of these are phenomenal and if you take the premium you know the critique sessions if you're lucky enough to get into those you know you have to book months in advance i won't lie but it's definitely worth the wait because whenever you do an assignment nathan himself will be going over top of your work, painting on top of it, talking to you about the specifics of how to make your art better, customized towards your particular skill level, your particular art. It's the ultimate fast forward. If you can get in on it, highly recommended. If you can't, just sign up for the subscriptions and just have one running, you know, and just always be learning. That's the biggest, you know, uh, no-brainer secret that I've discovered thus far. Um, and so I want to thank the viewers. I want to thank my co-host, Matt Johnson. And thank you. the biggest thank you goes to my wonderful friend and artistic <laughs> hero, Mr. Nathan Faust. Thank you, Nathan, oh, very just, much. You got it. I'm just glad to, to know you guys and, 
and uh, feel feel pretty warm about uh, the audience being out there, being interested in what we have to say. So thank you to all of you out there. Now, for those of you that are interested in checking out any future streams live where you can ask questions and everything, definitely sign up for the Schoolism newsletter because then you'll be informed 